So good morning, everyone. So I know that we have to start now, but can I ask you if, if we wait for a few minutes, just three, four minutes, and we'll start. Thank you. They will send an email with them. Yes, they should already have sent a logistics note. Did you get no? Maybe I did. I will <laughs> check. <laughs> yeah, because there were so many emails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so, we, sh we can start now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for attending our session. You are welcome. Uh, as you know, the, our session today, it will be uh, about the... It will cover two most important points. The statelessness issue and the citizenship. Actually, the main goal of this session to like to how to ex Examine the impact of digital citizenship on the uh, state statelessness in not in Africa but in all the world. Um, today we have we are four speakers. We have uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Thomas will give us our uh, he join us remotely and he give us an overview about the situation of statelessness in in Middle East in general in, in with focus in Middle East. And also we have uh, uh, Ms. Zahra Barazi. She will also uh, give us uh, a brief about the legal framework uh, about uh, on statelessness. And also I have my colleague Grace. Uh, she did a great job in the same topic. And she will give us the experience and the, as a case study from uh, Kenya. Uh, I'm here, and also I'm Muhammad. I will be moderate, moderate this session, and also I will be, speak, be speaker. I will cover the situation, the topic. I will focus uh, mainly on the impact of digital citizenship on uh, statelessness. 
uh, as I know that uh, not all the IG community are aware about the statelessness, uh, maybe this new. So we need to start uh, as introduction to give just some few words about the definition of each, each uh, word or each term we will use during this uh, session. Um, let me start to say that the emergence of internet has been associated with dramatic changes uh, in traditional life uh, and practice as part of the information and communication technology revolution. All aspects of life have become uh, digitalized uh, and everything in, in our world now has to face the online and offline. We have a commerce and we have e-commerce, we have government and we have e-government. Also the citizenship, we have a citizenship and now we speak, spoke about, speak about the digital citizenship. Uh, digital citizenship is typically defined through the, the, uh, the people actions rather than by their formal status of uh, belonging to nat nation state uh, and the rights and responsibilities. Uh, digital citizenship is, uh, is can, say, can mention that or can define it as the ability of the person to participate in the social in the, uh, uh, society online. Uh, when we come to stateless, so who is a stateless person? And this is one of the most important uh, terms we have to be aware from before we like go uh, forward in our sessions. A stateless person uh, means this person who is not considered to be national by any state under uh, the operation of its laws. Uh, also, one of the important things, when we speak about the digital citizenship, so this means we have a digital citizen. Who is a digital citizen? citizen. Digital citizen is uh, those who use the internet regularly and effectively. So to be a digital citizen, uh, it's not enough to just use the internet in a regular ways, but you should use the internet in an effective way. This uh, is the most important component in our discussion. How to use, to be digital citizen should be used the internet in an uh, effective way. And we will say what this means exactly. Uh, also, as I mentioned, the over using the Internet regularly doesn't doesn't mean a person become a digital uh, citizen by default. Because uh, someone should be use the internet in regular base and has a flexible access to internet and also has uh, uh, skills and the ability to apply the technology and use the internet in uh, for participation in in different. Uh, uh, activities in uh, activities in the life. If we speak about political participation, economic issue, uh, and everything. So uh, this session, as I started, the main goal to to explore the intersection between the digital rights and digital citizenship on one hand, and also to uh, uh, to explore the intersection uh, with the statelessness uh, studies on uh, another hand. So we assume that empowering a stateless person digitally could mitigate the adverse impact uh, of their stateless issue, also increasing the opportunity of their participation uh, uh, online, especially when we come uh, to speak about the learning issue, especially we face the COVID, uh, during the COVID, uh, speaking about the learning and e-commerce come uh, important point. Also, we assume that the uh, empowering statelessness person digitally would have positive impact on digital rights in terms of digital inclusion and reduce the rate of digital divide. So also, one of the most important things is the digital ID. And my colleague, Reza, will give us uh, like uh, a lot of information about this issue, uh, especially uh, in the Kenya. So uh, now let, let us to start with uh, Dr. Thomas. As I mentioned, he will give us an overview about the situation of statelessness in, in general and with focus in Middle East. Thomas? Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
so let, let me begin by saying it's, it's a pleasure to be with you all, uh, albeit remotely. Um, as, as Mohammed mentioned, um, the way we've divided up, uh, it's been decided that I will give a, uh, an overview of statelessness in the Middle East and North Africa, the MENA region, and I will just touch a little bit on um, possible implications for, for digital identity and digital citizenship, which Mohammed and other speakers will develop more um, in their presentations after. So uh, by way of very quick introduction, I'm a PhD student at the University of Melbourne, uh, and at the same time, I'm a member of the MENA Statelessness Network, um, which is a group that's focused on advocating for the rights of stateless people in the region. Very quickly, um, here's a map just to, just to make clear what we're talking about um, when we refer to uh, Middle East and North Africa. Um, so we've subdivided it into, into North Africa in green, the Gulf um, in purple, and the Levant area in pink. And just to say that the entire region, um, across the entire region, statelessness is, is quite a significant problem. Um, many of the issues um, go back to the, the origin of the nation state system um, after the First World War, um, when, when states were incorporated out of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so very briefly, um, Mohammed has given us a definition of what statelessness is according to international law. That is somebody who is not a citizen of any country uh, under the operation of its law. In Arabic, um, the, the term that's used officially for that is adimijansiya, which literally just means lacking nationality. Um, so this is the term that's used within the international conventions. Um, but what I'd like to go on to discuss is, is the fact that in reality, in everyday situations, a whole host of other terms are actually used across the region more to refer to those who don't have nationality, who don't have citizenship. So in, in different contexts, synonyms are used. Um, the bidun, which literally means without, without nationality, is a term that's used for stateless people across, across uh, the Gulf region. Um, other terms, for example, in Lebanon, maktoum, uh, literally means unregistered people. Um, and then various different terms are used according to how people have ended up stateless. So what I want to say here is that across the MENA, there's no MENA statelessness laws, uh, MENA nationality laws or other laws, the legal um, regime in across the region doesn't have a definition of, uh, unlike some other countries in the world or regions in the world. For example, in, in Europe, um, there are many, many national laws that have include the term stateless person and define it and there's an associated protection status. In the MENA, this is not the case. It's, it's not mentioned explicitly in any laws. And then all of these other terms are used. So it's quite a confusing patchwork if we're, if we're thinking about this issue legally. So that, that immediately has some implications for, for digital identity and how, how if there are, for example, exercises to, to digitally map citizenship status or, or who's included and excluded and potentially to, to try and include stateless uh, persons with a digital identity, there's, there's from the very beginning this question of how do we understand different statuses because it's it's a patchwork and it's quite unclear. Uh, just very quickly, in terms of international law, there are two main conventions relating to statelessness. Uh, there's a 1954 convention on the status of stateless persons, which is a protection uh, convention. That's all about the rights of those who are stateless. And then there's a 1961 convention, which is about reduction of statelessness, trying to end the problem. Um, these, these two um, instruments have very little, very limited 
uh, traction in the region, only a sm very small number of states have, have signed up to these, uh, these conventions, as you can see on the slide. So this again limits the, generally limits the awareness of statelessness as an issue. And, and I could say that even, even those states that have um, signed up to the conventions have not actually incorporated the majority of the provisions within their, their own national laws. So that's another big challenge. Here, um, so it, un unlike some areas, um, like in Europe, certain states have what's called a statelessness determination procedure, which is a, a, an official process by which they can recognize somebody as stateless. In the MENA region, that's not the case anywhere. N to my knowledge, no such, um, no such procedure even exists has, has been translated into Arabic um, as yet. Um, but here, again, the, the fact that the, the UN um, embarked um, in, in 2014, embarked on a 10-year campaign to, to try and end statelessness globally, um, we can see that there's been quite limited engagement in the MENA region, specifically. Um, at, at the halfway stage of this 10-year campaign, uh, a number of 360 pledges were made, but only four of those were from, from the MENA region. And those four were all from one single state, which was Mauritania. So a, a major, a major um, other factor in the region is gender discrimination, which is embedded within um, 24 nation the, the nationality laws of 24 countries around the world. Um, but approximately half of those are found within this region of the world, within the Middle East and North Africa. So it's a, it's a major cause of statelessness, um, whereby mothers cannot pass citizenship onto their children on, on the same basis as, as fathers. Um, it's therefore really important that any, any initiative to seek to provide um, digital identity or digital citizenship um, take this into consideration um, and look into how, how it's possible to support the reform process that, that civil society are engaging with on, on reforming these laws. Um, so so, so the, there is a risk that sometimes when, when, citizen, when uh, digital identity initiatives are introduced, it can actually entrench the, the problematic elements that are already within a nationality law, um, such as the, the reliance and focus on paternal lineage as, as a means of passing on citizenship. So, so some characteristics of the region uh, by way of uh, nationality and statelessness are that the courts, um, unlike some areas of, of the world, Courts in MENA have no jurisdiction over, over nationality issues. In general, nationality issues are under the Ministry of Interior, so therefore it's not possible to, uh, to challenge the lack of citizenship through most of the, of the legal um, infrastructure directly. It's, it's possible to, to maybe more creatively take an issue that is a result of statelessness, so like the deprivation of a certain right to education, to healthcare, to the court, but not to go to the court because directly somebody doesn't have citizenship. So that's that's a big a big issue and a big challenge. Again, as as I already mentioned, there's no legal status um, of statelessness and no associated protections under under any of the national uh, the national laws of the states in the region. Finally, all causes of statelessness are evident in the region, um, which I'll come on to more in this slide. Um, so as I already mentioned, some people in the region are stateless due to state succession, due to the legacy of uh, colonization, the fact that initial censuses um, of population were done uh, at the turn of the century when, when certain groups were were left out of, of the processes and, and the, the, in many cases this is still having impacts today 
Um, in addition to that, discrimination is a huge factor um, that causes statelessness across the region. And that can be on, on several bases. Uh, we've already mentioned gender discrimination, whereby women cannot pass on citizenship to their children. There have also been numerous cases of ethnic or religious-based um, discrimination. So we've seen the Kurds of Syria and Kurds of Iraq both being partially excluded from citizenship in their respective countries um, through, through uh, denationalization carried out um, carried out by, by the regimes in, in those two countries. The, I don't think I have much time to go into the other factors, but th there are many causes and uh, of statelessness. Um, these include also displacement due to conflict, the, the fact that people it is more difficult to register births in in such situations. Um, and then there have also been, particularly in recent years, um, some citizenship stripping practices, um, sometimes for political reasons um, in, in different countries. So really don't have time to go into it, but it's just wanted to stress that the, the Palestinian issue uh, in relation to statelessness needs, pretty much needs, it deserves its own lecture series. Um, so that's not something I'm unfortunately able to, to cover in at any depth today. Um, here, in terms of statistics, the main point to flag, so, so these are the statistics that are available, the latest statistics available from the, the UN um, from UNHCR who keeps statistics on statelessness. And here it's, it's really important to, to just stress how incomplete these statistics are. So particularly for this region, there's a large number of, you, you will see the question marks by Lebanon, Libya, and the UAE. Um, these question marks signify a country where it's known that there's a significant status population, but there's, there's no figure that is held. Um, at the same time, many of the figures that are held are understood by experts to be significant under-representations. Um, so, so here the question is, when, when it comes to, um, for example, digital ID programming, um, it's, it's very problematic that just even the scope and scale of the problem is, is so unknown. Um, m many of the countries in the region, it's known that there is a significant statelessness issue, but the figures that you, the UN holds are, are that there are zero stateless persons, for example. Um, so when, when the UNHCR has operationalized its global statelessness mandate, and, and it has a mandate for the identification and protection of stateless persons, uh, as alongside um, the reduction of statelessness, it's done so very differently in different countries. Um, so in, in certain contexts, the UN, UNHCR, issues stateless people with certificates. It registers them within its online database. It's, it's the database referred to as PROGRESS um, that UN uses for for registering asylum seekers and refugees and it also uses it for for registering stateless persons in certain countries but in other countries this practice is not implemented at all and that's largely sometimes due to the political situation depending on on the, the policies of the state um so given that Given that discrimination by the state is a significant factor of statelessness in, in the Medina region, that there are major concerns that rolling out digital ID programs can be a further, a further means of a state to, to simply marginalize or disenfranchise certain communities. Um, so here, here, this is the final slide, are just a few uh, resources for further information on, on statelessness in the MENA region. Um, very briefly, if, if I still have time, I wanted to just reflect on the fact that digital identity has not, has not been majorly implemented in the MENA region as yet, uh, unlike, for example, um, uh, 
other areas in for example in in, in africa um where it's it's been a bit more of a laboratory um for for digital citizenship and and i think that's something that my colleagues will speak about more um however th th there have been uh I i'd like to very briefly reflect on some of the issues that i've seen while working in in iraq where there was a digital um identity program being rolled out not specifically for stateless people um but for internally displaced people and that presented a number of issues and concerns um but while it's clear that digital id has has some major advantages some major benefits it can um break down some of the barriers to mobility to participation in society to access to services for example if somebody has a digital identity it's much easier to to register a sim card to access certain services at the same time having a digital backup of um civil identity of of registration databases is certainly advantageous given that in, in many countries in the region we've seen certain parts of the of the physical paper-based system being lost for example destroyed within within conflicts in syria and libya um but there have as i saw in iraq there were some serious uh downsides to the way that digital identity was was implemented there um so some of these included the fact that internally displaced people, um, some of the issues were were, were essentially political um, because it led to when a private sector entity was involved in um, establishing digital identity for, for internally displaced uh, persons, it led to a lot of confusion between and, and tensions between different levels of government. So this is something we really need to be aware of. Um, that there were disputes about who owned the data ultimately, um, and in in the case that I witnessed on the ground in in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, it was the case that um, the entity commissioned to do a pilot project actually refused to hand over um, the data to to the government entity that had commissioned it. And this was sort of a, a bargaining chip to to push for them to be um, commissioned to do to do further work to continue the establishment of the system. But this this led to a lot of a lot of confusion, whereby the local authorities couldn't actually access the system that they'd set up. Um, just the final, just the final two points were besides some some, some, some teething issues around incorrect data that often couldn't couldn't be easily um, corrected on the level of the IDP camps um, because it needed to be um, corrected through the central database that the that the camp management uh, staff didn't actually have access to and it would take a very long time to change it. There was also the issue of duplication um, whereby Iraq already had a very complicated civil documentation system where there's four kinds of physical ID um, that, that people are expected to have if they're citizens. Introducing a digital ID specifically for IDPs added another layer um, to this confusion. So there was parallel structures. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of those concerns I think are important when going forward in, in terms of thinking about how how best and how possibly to to take advantage of um, the benefits of digital identity in in the context of statelessness thank you thank you i'll hand back to you now thank you thomas for your intervention uh, i think we you gave us for uh, our super, uh, overview about the situation of statelessness and i think Everyone in, in the room now uh, aware about this, this issue and who is this, this statelessness person. Uh, and as we see that the lack of nationality and legal identity is a problem, especially when we speak about uh, the countries in the MENA region or African region, because without legal identity, we cannot access to legal documents. And this 
uh, as a result for that, you cannot uh, register or buy SIM cards, or register uh, with service provider to have internet in your home. This is a problem. So the question is, if you have or uh, within this situation of st a stateless person, you don't have any legal documents and you uh, don't have a specific nationality. So does that mean you excluded uh, digitally from interaction in online and dealing with uh, uh, daily issues? Now, as we start in our sessions, that everything now is linked with the internet. And every uh, uh, action now, learning and e commerce and banking and everything is written now in uh, internet. Visas, we need, if we need to get visa also, we do it in internet. So as you are stateless, so, so this means you are excluded. I think this is important question because also, although yeah, the stateless person are not recognized uh, as a citizen, uh, they are not totally excluded uh, from the digital ecosystem. I think this they should be included, uh, uh, which means that they are affected because in, they are affected by the, the digital uh, uh, transformation. Now, all the countries now in the world, world try now to to start to to transfer to digital uh, ecosystem. So they are not excluded. Also, they are the part of the society, regardless the, st the legal status, regardless the legal identity of them. But in fact, they are the part. They are exist in in Egypt. They are exist in in Tunisia, in Morocco. They are exist in Kenya, in Sudan, in, in elsewhere. They are exist regardless of the legal uh, uh, identity. The legal identity. So, and also now, as as a result of the emergence of the internet, we have the virtual society now. Regardless the physical society, we have a virtual society. They are part of the virtual society. Should be a part of this uh, uh, virtual uh, society. Our, Virtual community because virtual community. What is a, a, a virtual or a digital community refers? It refers to this community that uh, is uh, occupied with information and communication technologies. And this means that belonging to a specific uh, society by nationality is not a uh, precondition to uh, to 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 be uh, to belong to the digital uh, society or community and to become digital citizens. So. Although they don't have legal identity, as uh, uh, in traditional way, as we know, but they could be uh, granted the digital citizenship. And if they granted this digital citizenship, they will allow them to access the different services, education, its care, and its uh, uh, and other services provided in in our uh, digital ecosystem. Uh, I don't. I don't want to like uh, speak a lot about this issue because I think it's uh, uh, now. But the only one point uh, I need to like reflect about it: if we have like now citizenship, and we have also other terms called statelessness. So I think if you don't have the access, or forcibly you excluded from the digital ecosystem. So I think there is new term we have to think about it about with this term is about digital statelessness. I know that statelessness, this mean you don't have a specific nationality. But if you are a stateless person in our life, traditional life, but also you are excluded from access to digital ecosystem, so you are become digital stateless person. I know some of scholars don't accept uh, this definition, this may be this new, maybe another, this person working in this issue don't hear about this, this but uh, I think we need to, to, to think about this term. I think we need to adopt it to, to describe the situation of a stateless person who are don't have legal identity and they excluded or forced to be also or denied to have digital uh, identity uh, to be digital statelessness. Uh, to be digital citizen with, for the stateless person or other uh, person who has nationality, I think there is some preconditions should be fulfilled to be digital citizen. As we mentioned that to be digital citizen, that's not, you have to regularly using the internet, but in effective way. So to 
to be effective uh, in using internet, I think we, you know, we cannot say that uh, you have to use the internet in all your daily uh, activities, like in political issue, in social issue, in commerce, in healthcare. If you don't use the internet to uh, uh, accomplish these activities, I think it's not, or your using the internet is not effective. You like if you like just follow the Twitter or Facebook, this is not effective. This you are not effective. But if you participate uh, uh, politically uh, using the internet, so now you are effective. If you participate in involve the issues related to the society and the community through uh, internet, now you are citizen, a digital citizen uh, person. Uh, also, how to using the uh, to to do that, you need just you have to need have access to internet you have to access to equipment smartphones laptops if you don't if you have internet but you don't have uh, the equipment enabling you to use the internet i think we have the problem i think also the one of the this reflect in the some of uh, one of problem in africa especially when we speak about the digital divide because you know, in Africa and other regions in the world, we have a problem: the rate of uh, using internet and other and platforms. Uh, of course, uh, statelessness, especially in Africa, affected by this digital divide, uh, and also including or try to solve the problem of statelessness or to uh, supporting them or enabling them to uh, access to different platform. Maybe and somehow we. We assisted to to reduce the rate of digital divide in in in, in Africa. Uh, other issue also, it's not my uh, colleague Thomas has uh, sp speak about this about the digital uh, uh, ID, because as we mentioned, if you don't have official documents from your country that you should belong to by your nationality, so that means you don't have the legal document. You don't. Uh, uh, can get uh, or have the digital uh, ID. Because we don't need, we don't need documents say that this person is Egyptian or Ethiopian or Eritrean. I think it's enough to have a card or have uh, some official document, even if established that you are a stateless person, it's enough. But the problem is to be acceptable by the governments to using this card or this ID to register with service provider to access to internet to access to the SIM cards. Uh, I, I can't stop here, and I think my colleague Chris has uh, what uh, can tell us about the, 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 like the real case in Africa from the Kenya and how lack of digital identity uh, affects the stateless uh, person in, in Kenya. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all for um, coming to the session and uh, also for the people who are joining online. Um, maybe I could start by um, just adding a little mix to the definition and um, saying that um, we can also think about statelessness as your state. Yeah. Uh, for example, when um, you, I, I go back to my country as Kenya, what is my state? Uh, am I considered a national of that country? Am I considered a refugee? Am I considered um, a resident uh, because I come from another country, but I am currently uh, residing there as I work or um, do business? Am I considered a tourist and so on? Um, I think this definition is also important because um, a lot of countries through the law have defined what your entitlements are depending on what your state is. Yeah. So, for example, if you're a citizen, then maybe you have um, uh, access to so many um, opportunities and rights. But if you're just a resident, maybe you cannot vote or maybe your voting is limited. And uh, if you're a refugee, maybe you cannot um, pursue some jobs and so on and so forth. Um, but I also wanted to state that other than what the law says, um, and, and this is an example from um, Kenya, you can also have uh, 
what maybe we should say de facto statelessness where um uh, and add just maybe go back a little bit and start by saying that even when you talk about um uh, uh, the law being um how you access your documentations that state what state you are we can all agree that as long as you're human and you're existing on earth you 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 are a person you do not need and and you're a person who belongs somewhere you have some membership and belonging you do not need a document to um to prove your membership because you're already human and um i mean you're not an alien so um but of course states have um over time appropriated this um mandate of uh, issuing citizenship documentation so what happens in um in 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 countries that have so many other competing priorities and um historical reasons for how people access citizenship documentation is that there are a, a large number of uh, populations um who have either lack the documentation or face barriers when trying to access uh, that documentation and so um these people now going by the other definition of statelessness that we had before these people are either considered stateless or at a risk of statelessness and it's not just a theoretical thing yeah in 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 places like kenya even because we've had a long practice of using this um, national identity card even entering a government building or living in a big city entering a building requires that document so you virtually cannot function um um without this uh, uh documentation you you virtually cannot function as a stateless person in the in the nice civic life you have to live in the margins and uh, either um live in a place without um um uh, a lot of services or something like that i i wanted to bring in um uh, the point on 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 digital identity and how this is changing everything by saying that um for a long time uh, even in kenya we used to have this um e even though we use the the identity documentation a lot um we also had um and it was unwritten but we've had um what you would call social minimums services that you could always access whether or not you had documentation for example um and this is something i'm so proud of um the country has tried so much to give uh, primary health care especially to women you know mother child health care has always been there for the longest time i can remember that all you needed to do was um go to the clinic if if you were privileged enough to live in a place that has these uh, services so whether it was um you know a government clinic or a missionary clinic or you could always go there and get your um your your primary health care but increasingly and because of this trend in digital identity now you're required to first of all have the the citizenship documentation or some kind of documentation before you can access the service so it is as if identity becomes more important than the service i kid you not even to get vaccination you need national identity which is um, almost hilarious because on the one hand you have this government objective to um to to have universal vaccination for covid uh, uh, i mean covid-19 for example but on the other hand you have this barrier called citizenship documentation because if you if your national identity does not exist in the government book you're legally non-existent and so you cannot access this yet it's a country that has had really really good um records in vaccination uh, especially with this childhood vaccinations because um this is always something that was um, accessible so this is um this is how um uh, statelessness can become um uh, also you know de facto that it is true you live in that country you were born in that country that if you followed the law you actually um um are tick all the, check all the boxes on on citizenship but at the same time because of um lacking documentation or there being barriers to that uh, documentation you cannot access services and so um you practically stateless because uh, you're not you're not having that relationship you're not getting anything uh from uh being a member of that uh nation and um 
I'd, 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 I'd like to add that, uh, in my view, there are two um, uh, factors that are uh, pushing this trend. One, as uh, Thomas already stated, is this uh, experimentation um, that um, is happening a lot, especially in Africa, because of uh, our connection with the um, development agencies and international policymaking bodies. Uh, because for sure, even um, um, th this kind of large scale um, uh, experiments on uh, giving everybody uh, digital identity as um, a means to either counting everybody or making sure that everybody has access to services has never been done before. Um, and um, I, I do not know why um, it couldn't be piloted. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of coercion. There's a lot of use of the state power to uh, make it mandatory and to uh, practically make it a barrier that um, that that pushes people to get this um, identity documentation um, because they need the services and then um, of course this is also very very much linked to uh, the markets and how uh, at this point in time in the technology companies have developed all these um, technologies for biometric identification of people for large scale um, storage you know Kenya for example has um, 52 million uh, people um, now there's technology that can easily store the the data of 52 million people and we are even told that um, the technology can allow um, you know deduplication like identification uh, real time of all these uh, 52 million people very easily and so on and so forth. Uh, same with a country like Ethiopia that has way more, maybe 120 million people. Um, so um, the market is pushing for this and of course it's creating a whole economy around that data um, uh, because um, you know, you need all these cloud service providers to um, to um, provide all the services you need to to keep on um, identifying and uh, authenticating people prior to any service they receive. Uh, and because there's such a push um, uh, to to move to this um, uh, digital citizenship, um, what happens is that the political issues are kind of swept under the rug. So in a country like Kenya, uh, you start with the people who already have uh, documents and you um, transform their documents into, um, into digital. You digitalize their existing documents, which means that you relegate the people who either lack documentation or face barriers, you relegate their cases to later, which also means that you further marginalize them because um, uh, they are legally non-existent. And remember the other thing about this digital um, life is that it's very um, remote. You never see um, you never see a person. You, I mean, there is no longer an office in in, in Kenya. There is a, a system called eCitizen through which you can access uh, a lot of services. I think over 20 services: business registration, driving license, apply for a passport, apply for your child's birth certificate. I don't think they actually have a physical office because everything happens on a screen. Yeah, so it means that it creates all these layers of relegating people. Yeah, they're, they're, they're first of all the people who do not have identity documentation in the first place. Those ones are completely cut off from e-citizen. They do not even exist according to e-citizen. They are those ones who may have the documentation but do not have the skills to interact with these systems. Yeah, those ones are now dependent on the market again because the market has also created um, service providers who will assist these people at a fee. Yeah, and then um, there are also people who may have the documentation, they have the digital skills, but they live in places that do not have access to these uh, digital technologies. There's no internet. So you've created um, uh, another problem that these people have to um, uh, move to a place that has uh, these services so that they can, they can um, access them. And so um, uh, I think that um, and this is another point I'd like to make, is that in, in countries like Kenya, the people who have historically faced barriers to identity documentation 
have for a long time spoken for themselves. They have for a long time advocated for themselves to get this uh, documentation. They have for a long time even proposed to the government what needs to be done. So, for example, in 2010, when we were uh, making a new constitution, they made it very clear what needs to be done, and um, they were very successful in getting um, um, uh, all these um, uh, ideas and, and on citizenship. But this has not been implemented. Instead, uh, people who, um, like international uh, uh, policy-making bodies who uh, do not live in Kenya normally, um, have come up with a different idea, which is, no, give everybody, everybody gets digital identification, yeah, which completely ignores the fact that digital identification depends on uh, the state and uh, citizenship documentation. So instead of uh, starting with the needs that are already there and responding to the problem as has been identified by the citizens themselves, we are now um, uh, um, closing that file and opening a new file which says um, uh, this is what we, we need to do. And um, we are clawing back on um, things that had made life so much better. For example, those social minimums I spoke about everybody could access school. From 2003, we had free primary education that was um, open to every child. For if, if, you, if you speak to especially people from rural areas, that is the first time that a lot of girls went to school. Now we are clawing back on that by saying, no, 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 you first need to uh, bring some citizenship documentation that gives you uh, an, an, um, an identity, a number, a unique identifier which you will use in in your educational journey, yeah, we are clawing back on um, on healthcare. That uh, that now increasingly people are being asked for their national ID. Um, so a lot of mothers who who don't have this um, uh, ID will will um, we, will not take their children for immunization and so on. And the last point I'd like to make is that the picture I'm painting it sounds so bad. If you go to speak to a lot of Kenyans, they'd go like, oh. No, digital ID is the best thing that happens since sliced bread because I can get uh, access to a lot of services remotely. Yeah, if you go like to the Kenyans who are living in um, major towns and urban areas, and that is true. It is true that digital ID can be very, very convenient, but this is for these um, kind of people who are already privileged. Yeah, the the point I'm trying to make is that the ones who are at the margins are the ones who are further marginalized and it's a very intersectional problem. If you're at the margins, you probably come from a community that has historically faced barriers, you're probably economically uh, challenged already, you're probably in an informal um, uh, working situation and so on and so forth. So the, the, the issue is that we should make a society that um, uh, takes care of even the smallest people and so um, one way to deal with um, uh, um, these issues of uh, status, statelessness and digital identity would be to start from the margins coming to the center. Yeah, because um, uh, it, it is even uh, one of the things that we, uh, for example, dreamt about when we were coming up with a, a, a new constitution which aspires to uh, create better living conditions for every person in the, in the society. Thank you, Ritz, for uh, this intervention. And I think the situation in, in Kenan somehow gave us like, uh, like the vision that there is some opportunities for statelessness to be belonging to the countries they, they uh, stay in, regardless they granted the nationality or not. This is not our discussion now. Uh, but I think if at least they have digital uh, IDs, they can access to uh, different services because this is more, it, because in fact, in our real fact that you don't have birth certificate, you don't have national ID, this means that you don't have access to education. For example, in Egypt, uh, in my country, if you don't have birth certificate or national ID, you cannot uh, access to education, to healthcare, to to justice. 
to to any government uh, uh, government service. So it's probably I think uh, uh, at least if we managed to include the stateless uh, person digitally, may mitigate the, the adverse impact of their situation, and at least they may be uh, guarantee the access to the basic service. So uh, let me now to back to Thomas. Thomas, you are with us. Thomas. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, here, I'm, I'm here, Mohammed, but, but Zahra is also with us, and I think it's ready. So uh, we have Zora. Zora, uh, you can give us in five minutes only uh, frame. Uh, there's an overview about the framework uh, about statelessness. Yes, but so only five minutes, Zahra. Okay. Okay. Just tell me when you need to stop. Just tell me when you So what I wanted to do today really is to just kind of um, be able to to place uh, the issue of statelessness uh, and really explain what it is for people, you guys who are working more on the issue of digital identity. Uh, to be able to understand what it is we may be dealing with when we're looking at uh, statelessness and, and problems of access to, to, to digital identity and, and issues of digital identity. So just very quickly, exactly what we mean as to what statelessness uh, or a stateless person means. Um, and there is a, a legal definition and it's internationally recognized definition on this. Um, a person who is not considered as a national um, by any state under the operation of its law. So that's quite simply what a stateless person is. Um, and the rest of the slide is really just kind of details where you can find that definition. And it's really important to understand that uh, it's not just a person who, it's not just about looking at the laws of a country and be like, okay, under that law, this person is a, is a citizen. Um, it's really about looking how the operation of the law works. So how uh, the law is actually implemented, how the law is actually uh, trying to, 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 is actually working well, not working well, is flawed, etc. So that's kind of the legal definition of what a stateless person is. So it's just someone, there's no state in the world that considers this person uh, a national. So it's not to be confused with, you know, a refugee who, who you know, has fled his country or her country, but still is a, is a national of that country. Um, and of course, when we talk about uh, the issue of nationality, it's very much uh, that legal bond that we have between us and a state. Uh, and it's that legal bond that allows us to, to enter and reside and it's allowed us to, to benefit from the rights that the state has a responsibility to give us. Um, when people are stateless, they, they, they don't have any right more often to, to reside anywhere in the world. Um, so that is one of the most fundamental problems they, they, they face, uh, them and their families, is not being able to, to enter and reside uh, anywhere in the world. So it's very much a uh, belonging to a particular country legally. Uh, and just to quickly, because we're from a different context here, sometimes uh, nationality and citizenship, if you're looking at kind of what this issue is in your own context, uh, nationality and citizenship sometimes mean very different things in different contexts. Um, it can mean, uh, and they, sometimes they're interchangeable. So sometimes they mean the same thing, but generally as lawyers who work under kind of international law, it's, it's the same concept, nationality and citizenship. Um, so I just want to kind of get a brief of the type of people we may be talking about when specifically in Africa when we're looking at stateless persons so we can kind of try and see whether it's some of the communities that, that you guys are working with or know well, um, some of the biggest uh, people who maybe risk are not having a nationality in Africa. So we're talking about long-term migrants and their descendants. Um, so people who, for example, when we look at uh, state succession, uh, people who, who, who weren't able to, to access any state, any, any nationality, uh, former refugees and those who return to countries who, for one reason or another, have lost the link to their original country. Uh, we see a lot of statelessness in cross-border populations across Africa. So a lot of countries where either um, these are specific ethnic groups that are, that are, that are either nomadic or cross-borders, or where the border itself has changed. Um, 
so these are kind of some of the issues that, that are faced there. And then, of course, vulnerable children. Um, so where children haven't been able to register their births, they, they don't have any documentation, they've been uh, child workers, they've been trafficked, they've been you know, part of forced marriages. So often we're talking about some of the already very vulnerable uh, uh, and marginalized parts of, of, of communities are also uh, those who, on top of that, are stateless, don't have uh, a legal link to any uh, city, uh, city uh, country, which could play into the kind of the concept of what, what it means to have their digital identity and what it means to maybe be belonging to something much, much kind of bigger than that. Um, I won't go through the how do you acquire nationality. I just want to quickly um, talk about the fact that statelessness really is a big problem. Um, so when we talk about statelessness, I think some people really assume that we're talking about, you know, a few people, um, but we're talking, I mean, there are no figures that are really reliable because when you are stateless, you often are in an, an unavailable or not present in any kind of statistics, in any kind of uh, documentation, any kind of records, in any kind of uh, potential to try and kind of... Uh, put together what numbers, so you're often legally invisible, um, which also I think being legally invisible and, and, and kind of the, the interlink of that with digital citizenship is, is really interesting. So there really are no numbers, um, but I mean, there are potentially uh, hundreds of millions of people who are stateless around the world. So it's, it's very, very much a big problem. Um, and not only is statelessness itself a human rights problem, I think this is really important because the right to nationality is essential um, and it is something that it ha is part of uh, international human rights law, but also it leads to other human rights consequences. And I heard my colleague um, Hamad now talk about some of them. So it's unable to vote, unable to travel, unable to marry, unable to, uh, to go to school, unable to access healthcare. So there's all sorts of human rights violations that, that come uh, along with that. Um, and then very quickly, I just wanted to talk about some of the uh, African specific. So we've got lots of international uh, human rights treaties that, that talk about the right to, to have nationality, the right to acquire nationality, the right to kind of uh, equal rights to nationality and transfer, et cetera. And the fact that statelessness is, is, is a violation of the human right. But there are also, if you're interested in it, there are also specifics in the African Charter on, on uh, human and people's rights, um, which talk a lot about uh, recognition of, of legal status. It doesn't necessarily talk about statelessness, but it talks about recognition of, of legal status. Um, and the Protocol on Rights of Women talks about non-discrimination in relation to nationalities, where you have countries sometimes that, where women can't give their nationality to their children. And the African Child on the Rights of Mother of the Child is very big on statelessness and ensures that every child has the right to acquire a nationality um, and kind of mirrors a lot of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in terms of what the rights of the child are in terms of acquisition of nationality. So it just kind of just show that um, the right to nationality and the right not to be stateless is very much embedded in international law. Uh, it's embedded in human rights treaties. There are specific treaties regarding statelessness itself and how to deal with that and how to identify it. But there's also regional specific treaties and charters where we can find um, where we can find this kind of played out. It's it's really important to note that um, statelessness means that an individual has no legal link, no legal bond to any country. Um, and it's important to know that as well as that being a human rights challenge, uh, it is also creates human rights challenges. And there are stateless people everywhere. Every country has high numbers of stateless persons because of some of the reasons that we, we talked about before. So I hope, I hope this was like helpful in just kind of trying to identify who and what profile we're actually talking about, what kind of protection mechanisms are there out there when we're looking at well, what does this necessarily mean for, for digital identity. Um, so I think I, I went over five minutes. I apologize, um, Hamad, but uh, I hope that was helpful. I think you should start this, uh, this session, but I know the situation. Um, uh, thank you. So now, uh, uh, I think uh, I have to ask Grace, what is the recommendation solutions in your point of view, you say that maybe mitigates the impact uh, or adverse impact of statelessness or 
the solution or suggestion that may be uh, empowering uh, the statelessness uh, digitally? <laughs> um, <laughs> I've always thought that um, if you ask any so-called stateless person um, what they think their nationality is, they definitely have one. Um, so for me, I mean, even as we're going through uh, Zara's uh, slide, um, sometimes the law comes to act as a barrier um, as opposed to, um, to helping people flourish in life. So um, there should definitely be like, maybe we should have a reset button where everybody says um, what country they belong to and they get um, uh, the documentation they need um, uh, in order at least to access. There should be some basic minimums that every person should be able to access even as we work out politically um, what other rights that, that, that are maybe, uh, um, uh, I don't use the word secondary because all rights are important, but there should be some basic minimums. Nobody should be unable to access healthcare. Nobody should be unable to uh, move um, um, from you know, one place to another in search of uh, uh, a better life. Um, nobody should be, and you know, at the end of the day, um, uh, we even forget uh, to connect issues like statelessness and creating these barriers with other things that are happening in the world. For example, a lot of movement is happening because of climate change. Um, sometimes we forget to connect uh, these issues and say, okay, um, this climate change is affecting everybody. What should we do as as um, as a community of humans to make sure that uh, we can be able to to equitably share what we have, yeah, to equitably uh, provide for everyone some basic minimums while still uh, keeping everybody else uh, 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 moving. So um, I think that is one thing for the continent of Africa. Um, I think it's also a high time, and I know there's a, there's a, um, a protocol on status, statelessness that is being discussed. I think it's a high time, especially with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, it's a high time we just said, let everybody just get um, uh, some documentation showing that they belong to whichever state, because after all, even for states, when somebody, um, uh, claims citizenship or claims to belong to you, there's also some benefit to the state. They'll pay taxes, uh, they'll contribute to that society uh, by being workers in that society or by um, uh, whatever they're doing in the life of that society. So it's it's not as if it's a favor, uh, it's a it's a beneficial and a relational thing that you, you get, you're acknowledging their, their existence and at the same time you're also getting uh, something from them. So um, uh, for the for the continent, I think it's a high time we took advantage of that to make sure that, uh, for example, you know, these people, small traders who live across uh, um, both sides of the borders in most countries, that they can easily keep doing what they were doing, keep having the life they were having uh, by either of the states or uh, on the two sides uh, issuing them whatever documentation uh, they need. So I think those are two um, ideas. I'm sure there are many more. Yes, thank you, Grace. Uh, Thomas, also, uh, we need to uh, hear from you if you have some uh, recommendation or final word you wanted to say. Sure. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, so, so I very much agree with everything that uh, my colleague Grace just said, um, and I would echo that. Um, I think, I in addition, it's it's really important to to just stress the the potential issues when when going down the route of of digital identity um, programming. That we do need to be very aware of is is it being implemented with the best intentions can states manipulate it uh, even even in contexts where a state is dedicated to making sure that it's identity for all there can then be all, all kinds of issues between public and private sector um in, in addition to that and maybe specifically on mina so one thing that we've really been focusing on in our work as the MENA Statelessness Network is building solidarity between people who are stateless. Um, 
and a lot of that has a digital element to it um and it's it's something that we can focus on um particularly when other other avenues might be very challenging we can't often this despite all the advocacy that everybody engages in and various activism it's ultimately the states that um can provide the solutions to, to this to this issue so as civil society we can't come with solutions in our hands often we, we can come with recommendations for solutions but it's very difficult to ultimately push and when we have when we have stateless people that we're engaging with we do sometimes feel quite empty-handed for what we can do but what, what we've focused on is building a sort of a network for um of solidarity so often between stateless persons who are in different countries across the region allowing people to to link up and learn about each other because that's that's something we hear about very very often um but stateless people um in, in one context for example we heard recently from stateless people in libya saying they had no idea that there were stateless people in almost every other country in the region and it was it was nice for them to build build links share experiences and, and when when people are stateless and therefore are limited in their possibility to to attend conferences internationally to to travel to to have that exchange the digital sphere becomes becomes all the more essential so i think that's something that in parallel to to the advocacy with states we we should bear in mind thank you uh zahra uh if you would like to say a final word for us okay okay so uh i think also uh, uh to mitigate the adverse impact of statelessness or to empowering the, the stateless digitally, I think uh, uh, it should be or they recommended that to include the stateless person in the progress of uh, digital uh, registration. And also, uh, uh, units are United Nations for uh, High, Com United Nations High Commission for Refugees to, um, to work more with uh, the host countries uh, to just convince them to 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 recognize and accept the UNSAR documents because in some countries the, the governments don't recognize the UNSAR cards as uh, as ID. Uh, uh, also, I think uh, one of the important thing is uh, about the internet governance uh, community and digital rights activists to to focus more or to address the, this point or this issue of uh, digital. Uh, uh, the question of digital inclusion uh, of statelessness, uh, stateless person during the different events like IGF or African IGF, I think this we need to just to be put like a focus in this issue and maybe um, this facilitate the dialogue with dialogue with, with governments to facilitate the to recognize to issue the IDs, maybe national IDs, as habitual residents of this person, regardless, we don't need nationality. Again, we don't need nationality, but this country is still habitual uh, residents for this person, so you have to grant them official documents they can, they could use to get the digital uh, ID. So, uh, in conclusion of this session, we have agreed that, if, is that so the conclusion for this is that uh, I think we agree now the uh, official nationality or you have uh, physical nationality uh, this is not obstacles uh, encounter stateless person to prevent them or to exclude them from the digital ecosystem. Uh, you are stateless, so you are still welcome to be uh, uh, digital citizens. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, you're patient with us, and now the floor is you. If you have any question, comments, we are happy to answer. Okay, so we have three hands, four, five. Okay, <laughs> lots of hands. So we can start from here.
Hi, thank you for this wonderful session. My name is Shuchi and I work for Nationality for All. We're an organization that works with statelessness in the Asia Pacific. And uh, we've been grappling with this question for quite a while now, um, especially the question of um, digital identity. And my question sort of revolves around the fundamental concerns of um, the problems that come with um, due to the lack of transparency, the development, the design, the implementation of um, digital identity, especially when it, like th what Grace was talking about, the problems that come with having digital identity, no matter how great it is in theory and sometimes in practice, especially for the stateless populations. And besides having a rights-based um, or a human rights-based approach, I wanted to understand tangibly how um, civil society organizations can sort of, um, what can they do to sort of mitigate the impact that um, would prevent the already marginalized population to become even further marginalized with, um, with this digital identity solution that we're coming up with? Thank you. Thank you. I think you have, you asked two questions. I think Grace can answer the first one about Okay, so Asalaamu Alaikum. Yes. I'm Nazmu Salihin from Bangladesh. I'm a lawyer. Uh, my question is: uh, First, uh, Bangladesh is in a, uh, in a in a situation where there is some uh, stateless person is there the Myanmar citizen, uh, there is a uh, refusee in Bangladesh. We are not accepting them as Bangladeshi, and their Myanmar is not accepting them as their citizen as well. If, if Bangladesh uh, accept to give them a digital identity, how come it will help them? Because Bangladesh is not going to let them in Bangladesh. They're in a confined place. And uh, they, uh, we are providing them food and shelter and medicine, everything. Uh, we, are not, we are not ready to allow them to come into the, Bangla into the main territory of Bangladesh. How a digital identity will help them? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Yusuf. I work with uh, Hakina Sharia in uh, Kenya. Uh, my question is a follow-up uh, from what Chris said about uh, people being on the move. And um, one of the things that people have, uh, have realized is that modern states are byproducts of processes such as colonialism, which does not uh, seek to take into account the interests of uh, communities that are traditionally moving across borders, moving in a nomadic way of life. Um, the question is, when digital identity is being rolled out as it is today, is it not a continuation of that same old colonial process, whereby these groups uh, that have lived the way they have lived, their interests are not taken into account, rather it is just a process of uh, documenting them for purposes of um, either dominating them or controlling them? That's my question. Okay, 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 so go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. My name is Jose Arraiza. And um, I just have a, a couple of reflections on a question. So the, the reflection is, uh, you know, basically technology fails. It can be misused politically, it can be misused uh, commercially, and it, uh, it is a very risky territory for human rights, for all human rights, and uh, citizenship at the center of, of them. And in this sense, my, my reflection is on those regimes that are actually not seeking to protect human rights. You know, we have, uh, Afghanistan, we have Myanmar, we have uh, many other countries that are, let's say, on the on the wrong side of, of history at the moment. No, so as a matter of international cooperation, what what do you think could be done to to prevent 
uh, these, uh, these states or these regimes from uh, acquiring and, and misusing this, uh, this technology that is so, so problematic. Thank you. So only we will have, we don't have time, so we will take only two questions. Mr. Martin, and this lady, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, and of course the panelists. Uh, my name is Dr. Martin Koyabe. I just wanted to make a reflection similar to what Jose said, but also just to really uh, look at the issues in more depth that needs to be considered. Uh, when you look at the issues around a, a human rights-centric approach to identity, it is valid. Those arguments are valid. However, we do have examples of countries that have had ID uh, cards, especially at the electronic stages, and these countries such as Estonia, they've had them for almost 20 years. Uh, we also see that the countries we are reflecting to, or the countries such as Kenya, for example, uh, they've gone there to do benchmarkings and all that, and they've come back, but still, they don't get it right. Uh, what we see are three fundamental issues. One is that most of the countries do not necessarily do the due diligence enough to make sure that, that they put the structures in place, the infrastructure and, and, you know, and, 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 you know, and things like that. The other issue that countries don't do is to make sure that they involve specific groups, whether it's civil society groups and others, in terms of how they need to do that, you know, digital, I mean, I mean, I mean the digital identity. And then the next is the issue of self-interest, which I think we are not addressing it in this particular stage. So self-interest is what causes what you're seeing as a mired uh, focus where countries do not get it right. Thank you. Thank you. The last question. The lady, the lady in the... Sorry. Hi, I firstly, uh, my name is Soha. I'm joining you from Apti Institute based in India. Um, it's a research institute and I apologize, I joined a bit late. So if this was covered, I apologize. But just reflecting on what, what Grace had mentioned around the alienation of a lot of these digital services and digital identity processes, um, I was wondering what the sort of possible offline systems are or parallel systems are that can be run sort of um, in addition to what we see as sort of like steady digitization is that a path forward is that a solution we're seeing where you don't just have to di to you know move digital or sort of expect or depend on technology what are the other solutions that we see whether that's dependent on civil society or otherwise uh, that are offline perhaps thank you so now we only have 10 minutes so this time for the panelists to answer the question so let me to start with uh, Grace. Uh, mm, you can answer. I think the, 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 the most important now, or the best techniques to answer the question <laughs> in the general. Um, so I agree with, um, I mean, some of the questions have been answered by <laughs> the other questions and comments and reflections. Um, but I agree, um, uh, especially with what um, uh, Dr. Koyabe and um, uh, was talking about, you know, um, doing apples and oranges. You compare Estonia, which is such a small country that is m probably more homogeneous with a country like Kenya that has uh, a very different... Yes. Oh, sorry. That has a very different um, uh, social and historical uh, uh, background. So... Um, uh, and then I'd, I'd also just like to quickly add that uh, for a lot of low and middle income countries, we are learning a lot from India because the, the, the um, situations are more similar. Um, I think it's interesting how India did not have this connection to uh, citizenship documentation. All you needed to do was to present your biometrics, but that still had its own um, uh, huge set of problems. And so um, the, the, I think one of the main problems with digital ID is this um, coercive way it's being uh, introduced that does not even give anyone time to reflect and do a proper needs assessment for their own particular situation and how it works and to resolve uh, some of these issues which you know like the issue in Bangladesh is quite quite political and uh, to figure out um, uh, how to sort it out and um, uh, so there is no 
one um, solution or one answer to all the issues that are arising. But of course, there's a lot to learn from uh, situations uh, that are ongoing, like India, um, Jamaica, where uh, they got a really good uh, decision from the court that is really helping a lot of um, other countries. And um, uh, to Jose, I'd say that the international policymaking bodies just need to chill and let um, and let people really define their problems and solve their own problems because people already know uh, the solutions to their problems. And then they can come in later when um, they are called upon, but not at this uh, situation where it's really top down, where they are forcing uh, countries to implement um, specific uh, or models of digital ID. Thank you. So, thank you. That's Thomas, uh, if you would like to answer of any question raised. Thank you, thank you Mohamed. Uh, so maybe I'll touch first of all on the, the question about nomadic populations. Um, I think it's, it's a very, very important point and it's, it's worth bearing in mind that a lot of, a lot of the communities that are na stateless today um, that uh, are experiencing protracted multi-generational statelessness. It's often very much uh, the legacy of uh, colonization and um, many of these stateless situations come about, came about through the process of, of state formation. Um, and it, the, uh, we know that the borders were often defined by colonial forces. But then that being said, I think the important thing, is, as Grace was just mentioning now, is the key is talking to stateless people and seeing what they actually want. Um, in, I don't know if it's similar in the context of Africa, but in, in the Middle East, in many cases, um, communities that have traditionally been nomadic, many of those are now semi-nomadic or, or settled um, and in, in a lot of cases that is partly due to due to pressures by the state um, to settle but then you will get different subsections or sometimes the majority of um, a traditionally nomadic um, or, or mobile community now wanting to to integrate more in, within a particular state so it's, it's really about understanding what are the priorities of, of the people affected. Um, is it about them continuing cross-border uh, movements and, and that's the priority? Or is it about integration within one particular state or, or a combination? Um, but very often, for, for example, in Lebanon, uh, I did research with, with the Bedouin community there and the, the um, several other traditionally, traditionally mobile communities and very often, very often they were saying that they hear from the state the idea that they don't want ID, they're not interested in in having civil ID because it's not important for them. But in, in terms of practical issues and access to access to services, it is very important for healthcare, etc. Um, thank you, Thomas, because we are running out of time. <laughs> thank you, so just we don't have uh, one minute. So I think we'll, I'm sorry we cannot answer all the questions because we are out of time. But generally speaking, I can say that I think the, the, the question about the role of civil society, as we discussed during the, the, the workshop or the session, uh, the, the access to internet or using the internet should be meaningful. So I think the NGOs has a, a right, a rule to deal with the communities and the st stateless person, even uh, this person has nationality, if you, they cannot using internet uh, uh, effectively, the, how to use it effectively to be citizen uh, uh, person or digital citizen. Uh, also about the, the question about the the Bangladesh, how we can help if they are stay in rural area or remote area and they're not allowed to come to the capital, for example. I think this is no problem because this is still uh, a responsibility of the governments to provide the service for this person in remote areas. So like refugees who are staying in camps, so the government have to provide uh, the service in their way. Um, also, uh, 
I think the granting digital ID, how it help is a status person. I think at least they can access some service online that they cannot access in offline. About the colonization, I think this is a very big topic, but from my point of view, even if, even if, because the situation of status person is very difficult, even if the, some power will use this to control them or something, but they will give them access to grant access to some service. So from my point of view, it's okay. Uh, the last thing about the situation of status, we cannot, I think this is the most important point. We don't, we don't have to deal with uh, digital rights or especially in particular also uh, stateless digital rights as a separate issue. It's one of, uh, it's a part of the whole digital rights. So uh, to answer Mr. Khan about the, the regimes who don't prevent or don't provide these rights, I think this problem, we need to fix the human rights in general in these regimes and convince them to respect the human rights in general. So that's mean, uh, as a result, there will be respect to the digital rights of persons. So digital rights and status uh, is a part of the whole big issue. Uh, thank you for you. <laughs> and you want? Very, very quickly, I wanted to say that uh, we'll have a session, this is a shameless plug-in, we'll have a session on digital ID on uh, Friday morning, it's in the program, where we'll discuss more about uh, digital ID, and I think it would be so great to take um, these discussions on statelessness and um, integrate them, as uh, Mohammed had said. Thank you so much. You're most welcome to that session on Friday morning. Thank you.